The first text is Psalm 116. Uh, 16, 116. Interesting, both 16 and 116 psalms uh, are concerned themselves with salvation and resurrection life. I love the Lord because He has heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Because He inclined His ear to me, therefore I will call on Him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called in the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, He saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed, even when I spoke, I am greatly afflicted. Turn now, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Reading verses 13 through chapter 5, verse 1. Paul has spoken about the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, a glory that is proclaimed in the gospel that is transforming in its nature. And that this treasure of the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ he has been placed in earthen vessels earthen vessels that in their very life experience undergo the sentence of death so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in and through them. Verse 13. Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak knowing that He who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into His presence. But it is all for your sake, so that His grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self or our outer man is wasting away, our inner self or our inner man is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. But the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. For we know that if the tent, that is our earthly home, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we pray for the true illumination of Thy Holy Spirit and accompaniment of Thy Spirit to Thy Word to bring home the reality of the things we speak of that they might be received and applied and the souls of Your people greatly benefited. For Christ's sake, we pray. Amen. Well, there's two ways you can look at life. There's two ways you can gaze upon life. One is with the eyes of faith, and the other with just simply seeing that which is visible and responding to it. All the uncertainties and the dreadful possibilities that exist in time and space. The first one draw attention to is where 
We see the heavy blows of life that knock us to the left and to the right and sometimes knock us down. We see those heavy blows and the difficulties and the decay and death and disappointment and shame. We see all of this. And then out of that position of seeing it, we become overwhelmed with it all. And we cry out to God, Lord, I'm so overwhelmed with all this. Please make it stop. <laughs> Please change it. <laughs> now that is basically an unbelieving posture. The second one is the gaze of faith that is here recommended in this text for us. It is a gaze on the eternal as the first and foremost point of recognition and that which we are primarily occupied with. It does not deny the temporal. It doesn't say, well, these things don't exist. We, we don't turn into Christian scientists. You know, evil is unreality. Doesn't, it's not really there. No, we, we don't deny the fact that the temporal and its affliction, its uncertainties and its pressures are bearing in on us. But these things become tamed and find their proper place with the gaze of faith into the eternal realities of the kingdom of God that draw near to every believer in Jesus Christ. The gaze is fixed. It is a fixed gaze because faith is is fixed. And faith is fixed because the Word of God that reveals, that is a portal into knowing and accessing eternal realities, is also fixed. And so Paul could say, even though his ministry, and you know, by way of analogy, our own lives, are full of trouble, bringing him to the door of Deep difficulties in life, very unsettling, even facing death itself. He says this little phrase over and over. We do not lose heart. <laughs> we do not lose heart. Now, why is that? Why does Paul say we do not lose heart? Well, because of the spirit of faith. That is the Holy Spirit that creates faith. It's faith that is of a spiritual sort. But it's not just faith and faith. Faith is that which is looking outward, away from itself. It's not turned in on itself. And all those various Eastern philosophies of life that keep wanting you to turn in to find the eternal are lies, because you will not find the eternal by looking in. You'll just find deeper and deeper levels of the temporal, and the more you look, the more uh, you will find its distortions, because that's the nature of the fall itself and us as part of that fallen order. So don't buy into that lie. Eye of faith looks out. Verses 13 through 15 in this very text, we have the same spirit of faith, that is, as the Old Testament believer that has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe, we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Outward, not inward. It's not depending on one's own assessment. That's the trap. We think that we can figure things out and given enough time, we'll figure out more things. It's the great uh, Star Trek illusion. Just given a little more time, we'll eventually improve and be pressing the boundaries of eternity itself. No, we say no to our own rational abilities to assess things, and we 
say yes to what God's Word says. What God's words tell us is the nature of reality. And that word, you see, is a portal into the unseen, into the eternal, into that which is solid granite to build our lives on, to journey through life. And Paul says that this reality is a reality that we share all the way back with the Old Testament saints. The same spirit of faith, he says, according to what is written. The same spirit of faith from Psalm 116. I believe, therefore I spoke. But you must understand that the Old Testament saints had a little different angle on it than us. Because they looked at the word of promise. And we speak the same as they. We have the faith the same as they. But promise is not as clear as the reality. Yes, Abraham offered up Isaac upon the mount. And, and, and Hebrews tell us that that three-day gap uh, was uh, in, indicative that Abraham, though he knew he was, was going to slay his son, that God would raise him from the dead. That, you, know, he, you know, he was like Sherlock Holmes. He just reasoned back and said, okay, if I'm going to kill him and, uh, and God's true to his promise, then God's going to raise him again. Deduction, right? The promise. David here has the promise. Psalm 116. But the apostles, we must understand what is unique about, the, about an apostle. An apostle doesn't just depend upon the promise. He believes it. But he has seen the fulfillment of the promise in a person, Jesus Christ, in his resurrection from the dead. <laughs> you know, if the Old Testament promise is vitamin B12, Paul says we got the whole complex. <laughs> we got the real shot in the arm. We have eternal life in Christ. We speak and proclaim Christ, the fulfillment in the person of the promise, in his life, in his death, and in his resurrection. Praise God. Paul says we have insight into the actual world of the resurrection itself, communicated and opened up to us now by the Word of God as it opens up to us the Christ that has come. The Christ that is at the now at the right hand of the Father. The Christ that we, we saw and, and we now bear witness to and write about. So Paul joins himself and this apostolic witness to the saints of the Old Testament written word, which anticipates the resurrected Christ. He now joins himself to it to proclaim the resurrected Christ. Proclaim that Christ, that they look to, has come. And thus we preach. We believed and we preached. Remember Thomas? Thomas said, oh, I'm not going to believe until I can really do hands on. Fine, all right, get over here. Put your hand in there, put your hand in there. Now believe. <laughs> and that calls Thomas to speak. The great famous anti-Jehovah's -Jehovah, Witness saying. Yesterday the Jehovah's Witnesses were in the neighborhood, parking, descending upon all the houses, proclaiming their heresy, and their damnable heresy. My Lord and my God, Thomas said. <laughs> he touched, he believed, and he spoke. <laughs> Who is Jesus? Begotten, not made <laughs> the eternal son that's what they preached they knew it and they had both the old testament promissory word and now the apostles had the new testament word and now we have that new testament word it's called the new testament the apostolic word and through that word, God is gathering together his assembly. An assembly 
that he is gathering together as that word is spoken to this very day. God's not done yet. He is still speaking. He is still gathering. And he will finish his gathering. All 144,000, going back to Revelation, will be gathered. Knowing, Paul says, verse 14, he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. And that when? In that last day. We're all going to get there. God's program will not fail. As weak and frail, as inefficient as it appears to be on the surface, the truth of the matter is, with the eyes open to the eternal, we know this is God's program. Christ will build His church through what He's done and through delivering His word, calling out His people to His name. And we will stand together with all the people of God, be presented to God in the world to come, in that day. What a day that will be. What a day that will be. But in the meantime, we're given to weekly dress rehearsals of that day. And I hope you believe that. We have weekly dress rehearsals where we Imitate the great gathering of the people of God around Jesus on Mount Zion through the preaching of the gospel. A message proclaimed in the city of death. A message proclaimed in an arena of decay and discouragement and damnation. But a message of redemption. A message of redemption. And there in the spirit of faith, the spirit of faith of Abraham, the spirit of faith of David, the spirit of faith of Paul and the apostles and of the early church, the spirit of faith that is resident right now, right here in the hearts of God's people, sharing together. Have that spirit of faith. And therefore, we don't lose heart. Now, there are many people that are not in church this morning. They're not listening to the gospel. Some people are in church and they're still not listening to the gospel. That's pathetic. And they say, well, I'm going to be just fine. I'm going to be just fine, unlike you. My kite string will hold. I'll be just fine without that. It's nice for you but I'll be fine without it. My kite string will hold. And that is called self-deception. That is called self-deception, looking straight eyeball to eyeball, the train of inevitability. Your weak fragility before life's heavy tragedies will reach a breaking point. Your kite string will snap. And your hollow optimism will go up in smoke. Every single one of us need a granite foundation, not shifting sand to stand on. And that granite is this, that the long-awaited redemption has arrived The long-awaited promises have taken embodiment in the person of Jesus Christ in His cross and His resurrection. As Isaiah says, the Lord was pleased to crush Him as a guilt offering for your sin and mine. Your sin is great, but the guilt offering Christ is greater. And the Lord has raised him into the eternal kingdom. So repent and believe. That's the granite foundation. That's the granite foundation on which, if you're standing there, you can speak with certainty about it. Verse 14, knowing. Paul didn't say maybe, uh uh-huh, could be, probably is. That's where I'm rolling my dice toward. No, knowing. Verse 14, 
Knowing is the foundational stand of the reality of the word promise being realized in the person of the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ, dealing with our sin, dealing with our death and decay in the city of death, so that we might not lose heart, but be strengthened inwardly, despite the fact that we are hammered outwardly. Now that, Paul says, is grace. That's verse 15. Three big words in verse 15. It is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people. That's the program. It's going to extend to more and more people. Until what? To the last one is there. Now, it's been extending for 2,000 years. And I suspect it's going to go on for a little while yet. Resulting in thanksgiving to the glory of God. Thanksgiving to the glory of God. Grace. Grace. Grace is God's finished work in the cross and resurrection of Jesus, the done deal. He's dealt with your sin. He's dealt with death. Stand on it. That's grace. God has done it. You haven't. You just receive it. I'm in. I want it. I don't deserve it. And thus it erupts in thanksgiving. The gift of grace. On a lot of people's mind, that's not a big deal. Whether or not I go through life thankful or not is no big deal. You're so sanguine, so thankful, so grateful, so happy, so giddy. It is a big deal on a spiritual level. Because thanksgiving to God means that I'm not thanking myself or thinking of somehow I have factored into contributing to the outcome of my being a beneficiary of receiving the kingdom of God and entering into it. That's why thanksgiving goes up, because it's built on grace. And that's why from this pulpit, you have insisted upon grace thoroughly, not 94%, 100%. That's why Charles Spurgeon said that Calvinism is just a nickname for the gospel. Why is that? Because he recognized the theme of thoroughgoing 100% grace in its message. Grace is the grounds, charis, that's the Greek word, charis, is the grounds for Eucharist, thanksgiving. (laughs) Thanksgiving is based on grace. Eucharist is based on charis. To the glory of God. In God's economy, for Him to receive the glory is everything because of who He is. And so the Apostle Paul wants us to be able to stand on that firm foundation, knowing these things, confident about these things. So at the end of the day, we might be trusting in what Christ has done, what God has done in Christ for our salvation, to give thanksgiving and glory to God. And that's why uh, mere vessels of clay that are broken in life and doomed to the dust are able to give thanks. Because those (coughs) fragile, broken vessels of clay doomed to return to dust have been introduced to another world through the gospel, through the person and work of Christ. It's been communicated to them a whole other world of permanency and of life in Christ has been communicated to them and they have received it by the spirit of faith. And so they look outwardly They look outwardly to that granite foundation of what the Word of God communicates to them. For faith comes from hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so, brothers and sisters, where does that leave us? How vital is it that we not forsake 
daily intake of the Word of God, that we read it in our families, that we come to church and hear it proclaimed, because faith will begin to fade if not fed by the Word. Well, this outward look of faith to Old Testament promise and the New Testament person and the realities that that person has secured results in inward renewal. Inward renewal. That's, that's where it leads to. Now you can go to Barnes and Nobles to the self-help section and find out all the groovy ways to pick yourself up by your own bootstraps and change yourselves and reinvent yourself. Or you can say, hey, you know, that's, bisped, that's one big long trip around a one mile track that guess what? It ends right where it began. <laughs> I'm still me. <laughs> or you can come to the Word of God. <laughs> Verse 16, we do not lose heart, though our outer man is wasting away, our inner man is being, what? Renewed day by day for this light momentary affliction, three words, is preparing for us, three words again, eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient. What are the things that are seen? Well, everything about this life and all of its miseries and difficulties, but the things that are unseen are eternal. There's the fixation, brothers and sisters. This is why we do not lose heart, even though the outward is pained and pressured. We do not lose heart because the inward, though facing decay outwardly, inwardly, is being renewed by the grace of Christ. Outward decay, Paul says. It's breaking down. That's decay. It's breaking down. Because something else is going on within. There's a building up, Paul says. Now imagine those processes, if you would, for a moment. Breaking down of the inward. Building, or the outward. Breaking down of the outward building up of the inward. See that? That's how, that's how it works. Now we think that when the outward is being broken down that it's over. <laughs> I'm baked. I'm cooked. Uh, yikes! Ah! I'm freaking out. Right? But the reality is for the spirit of faith the gospel of Christ as the inward outward gets more and more challenged the, out, the inward becomes more and more clear. You see, the Word of God is the portal into that eternal world that Paul wants us to get a gaze at through Christ and get fixed on through the Word of Christ. But it's difficulties that adjust the lens to see it better. Nothing wrong with the portal, but our eyes, our lens needs to be adjusted. And the adjustment comes through the difficulties because it kind of, as it is, forces us to look more intently. And that's a good thing. And so it's important for us to be able to distinguish. To be able to distinguish and live out of the difference between the outward and the inward. It's vital. That's what Paul says here. He uses three big words, you know, the, the, to describe the contrast. Light momentary affliction. 
And when you read this light momentary affliction, you're tempted to say, oh, Paul, you don't know my life. It's not light momentary affliction. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Paul says, well, just read about some of my stuff. <laughs> and you go, hmm, I guess you do know about my life. <laughs> and Paul says it's light momentary affliction. That's all it is. Why? Because in and of itself it's really light? And no. Because of the contrast <coughs> with the things that are unseen, that are, are eternal, weighty, and glorious. It's beyond all comparison, Paul says. If you could only see it, the open eye of faith through the portal of the Word. And to be able to have that sight, the ability to distinguish and live that out, that difference between the temporal and the eternal, that's everything. And that's what the Gospel Paul says, embedded in the Word, Old and New Testament, that has now arrived in Jesus Christ, wants you to be able to distinguish. Because why? You don't want to lose heart. That's why. See, we live in very compressed times. We live in very compressed times where people, life and its meaning and its significance is all squeezed into a moment. The past is forgotten about. The future is not put into consideration. Just live in the moment and the sensations and feelings and what's happening right now. That's, that's the mindset of this fallen world. You know I know that. Because when I go through this world, here's where I see people. I see people walking down the street. I see people driving their cars. You know, wait, let's see. Driving their cars, walking down the street, restaurants, everywhere, in the moment, locked in, hardwired. It's all right now. It is, I must confess, one of the reasons why I have not caved. <laughs> to the consternation and sometimes disgust of people I know whose names will not be mentioned. Because there's something about that forgetting and not detecting and not living out of this very reality of the distinction. It's an avoidance of it. It's a lockdown. And the Word of God renews our minds, Paul says. We are renewed. The inner man is renewed. And affliction sharpens that renewal to see crisply, more crisply and clearly. So that the Word and providence works together. Why do we lose heart? Because we sink into discouragement and resentment. We feed the flesh with the eye of sense and we starve the spirit of faith. And this is why, brothers and sisters, this is, this is one amongst many reasons why we need public worship. This is why it's so vital. Public worship, we come, we gather to assemble, to do a, rest, a dress rehearsal of the eternal, where I really am, where I really belong, what I really live out of, who I really am. It's a time when we turn off our phones. We turn off our lives to focus on Christ because it has its transforming power and it enables us to re-emerge into this world with a differentiation and the consequential benefits of that differentiation in Jesus Christ is we do not lose heart. We're encouraged. Even though the world itself and everything around us is discouraging, 
And so public worship is where we insist upon, yes, Christ is my life. And nobody, nothing, no matter how discouraging, no matter what impending doom or okay corral I am faced with, can take that away from me. Impossible. That is my true life. So look, look up. Fix your gaze upon the things above and allow yourselves, as Paul says, to be encouraged and to continue undergoing this renewal of the differentiation between the light and the truly weighty. <laughs> See, we get them turned around. We do. We get them turned around. Oh, the weighty is what's happening to me. Oh, weighty. What about the things of God? Oh, well, I kind of lost sight of those, didn't I? <laughs> Yes, you did. <laughs> well, how do I get that sight back? You attend to the Word, you attend to worship, and you come, and you get strengthened. That renewal comes back again, and you can be able to say with Paul, yeah, yeah, it is a light, momentary affliction. It is. Compared to what I see, to pair what I've begun to see, and the spirit of faith looks not only to that reality, but it looks upward. It looks upward and onward. Verse 1 of chapter 5. If we know that if the tent that is our earthly frame is destroyed, I like how Paul just pulls it all back. You know, what's the worst thing that can happen to you? Well, let's see. You can die. Oh, okay. Okay, if your tent is destroyed, <laughs> if the, the premier worst thing happens, you know, we have a house not made with hands. Eternal in the heaven. There you go. <laughs> there you go. A true ultimate victory. The resurrection body in the heavenlies. Yes, you're attended with decay and difficulties in a fallen world. Yes. Yet even though this tent may be torn down and dismantled, which it inevitably will as it undergoes decay, you have another building, eternal in the heavens. If you look in the mirror and after you take your shower and nobody's around, you go, ah. I wish, fill in the blank, you know, I wish my nose was different. I wish my eyes were, I mean, right? You're wishing all this stuff. And you start, then you start thinking, well, you know, maybe I could have this done. Maybe I could have that done. And this oh, boy, the idolatry of the body, right? Yeah. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You're getting a great body, a great face. That you're going to be happy with. So just wait. Please. It's okay. It's okay to get old. Start getting gray. Start sagging. You know, all that. It's okay. Come on. <laughs> Brothers and sisters. Christ. This is a liberating reality for you. Don't take the way of the world. We have a body, eternal, beautiful, perfect in the heavenlies. And so Paul calls upon us, us vessels of clay here, even though we inevitably will have a hard go of it. And you already know that, you're having a hard go of it. You have a glory, you have a treasure. In that earthen vessel, it's just waiting to break forth in all of its permanency. But now you have the spirit of faith. Now you have the spirit of faith, the light of God's word, and the fire of God's providence. 
It is these two ingredients, these two ingredients that will see you through. Two times, Paul says, knowing. I like that. 4.14 and 5.1. Knowing. Are you knowing? You say, oh, that's good for some people, but I'm not there yet. You should be knowing. That's what it's all there for. Knowing. Knowing what? Number one, knowing that God raised Jesus from the earthly to the heavenly. Knowing, number two, He's going to do the same for you who trust in Him. There will be a transition from the earthly body to the heavenly body because Christ undergone that transition from earthly to heavenly. How do you know you will? Because He's undergone that transition and you in communion with Him as the pioneer of your faith, you too will undergo that transition and thus that historical fact you can know will be your fact as well. What a blessing that is. Oh, how wrapped up we are in this temporal existence. How much anxiety and fret and worry is generated because of our earthly body. And Paul doesn't ask us to become inhuman. But what Paul does ask us is in the midst of all that worry to temper it all, to put it in its place through the spirit of faith on the eternal realities that have dawned in Jesus Christ and to live your life with the contrast that two eras, the world to come and this world, are overlapping in you. <laughs> Old and new creations are overlapping in you, in Christ. And it's not an overlap of equality. Paul says it's beyond comparison. In Romans 8, he says it's not worthy of comparison. He even upgrades it. You know, it's beyond comparison, not even worthy of comparison. It's hard to grasp. It's hard to grasp, I admit it. But grasp it we must by the spirit of faith. For when we do grasp it, when we do grasp it, it will energize us. And it will produce in us, in the face of every situation and reason that would fuel and tempt us to complain, it will energize us and fuel us to bring thanksgiving to God for the contrast. And when we do, it will elevate us inwardly with a glorious renewal. And we'll be able to say with the Apostle Paul, because of the gospel, because the cross is greater than our sin, because the resurrection is greater than all the decay in and around us, we'll be able to say with the Apostle Paul, we do not lose heart. And it's not just that we don't lose heart. We gain heart. True heart as the people of God. Amen? Amen. 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 Father in heaven.